John MacArthur's pulpit goes up and down like that, so uh, it's pretty cool. <laughs> Just playing with that. Well, I'm glad that you're here. Um, my name's Steve Lawson, and I live in Dallas, Texas, and I'm so happy to be here. And I've been speaking at the Impact Conference, and probably most of you have been at the Impact Conference. And I preached this morning for church, and I'll preach tomorrow morning. You may be in school. I don't know. I, I would just skip school. <laughs> Is it a holiday tomorrow? Ah, oh, wonderful. Okay. Well, I, I hope to be able to, to, to see you again. Um, it's hard to know what to speak on when I just have one opportunity to address you. And I want to talk to you about a very serious subject. Um, and your pastor has encouraged me to talk to you about this subject. I want to talk to you about hell. Uh, hell's a subject that we rarely talk about, but it is so serious that we really must talk about it. Um, there are some of you here in this room who will go to hell, and you need to know where you're headed. Jesus had more to say about hell than anyone else in the Bible. Jesus had more to say about hell than he did about heaven. And if we are to teach and preach like Jesus, then we must address the subject of hell. So, I want you to think with me today about the subject of hell. And the reason is, number one, I don't want you to go there. And the reason number two is, you need to reach your friends and your classmates with the gospel of Jesus Christ, lest they go to hell. And you need to be so thankful for those of you who are saved. You need to be so thankful that God has rescued you from eternal destruction. This is no small matter to be saved. R.C. Sproul has written a book entitled, Saved From What? In college, he was walking across campus, and a, another Christian who had just recently come to faith in Christ was so excited about his faith, he came up to R.C. Sproul and said, Brother, are you saved? And at that time, R.C. was, and he said, yes, but it so scared him, he said he ran back to his dorm room and thought, well, I know I'm saved, but saved from what? And God has not sent His Son into this world to save us from being lonely. He hasn't sent, sent His Son into this world to save us from being insecure. He has sent us into this world to deliver us from eternal destruction. So in the course of this time that we're going to spend together... I've just kind of lined up my ducks, and I've got 15 things I want to tell you about hell. Some of you are note takers, and I'd, I'd encourage you to write these down, because these are really good. I stayed up late last night and got up early this morning, because I, I didn't have this message this time yesterday. And so I went to a restaurant last night and sat there by myself and just tried to pull all my thoughts together. What would I say to you that hell is? So you ready? Thank you for that. <laughs> it's not funny. <laughs> she blew it. <laughs> she knows. <laughs> figured out the level of humor <laughs> that works. All right, so let's talk about hell. It's kind of an awkward transition. <laughs> All right, number one, that's where it has to begin. Hell is a real place. Hell is more real than Hastings or Havelock. It's a place more real than Napier. 
It's more real than Auckland or Melbourne. Hell is a real place in the universe. It is a place on God's map. Three times in the New Testament, it's referred to as a place. In Matthew 8 and verse 12, it's referred to as that place. It's not the figment of someone's imagination. It's not just a a nightmare that exists in in someone's uh, mind. Hell is a real geographical place. Matthew 22, verse 13, it's referred to as that place. It's a real place on God's map. And Luke 16, verse 28, is referred to as this place of torment. So those who go to hell are going to a very real place that is far more real than Havelock North. You don't want to go there. Second, hell is absolutely necessary. There there has to be hell. The very attributes of God necessitate that there be a place, a real place, that is hell. The holiness of God demands that there be a hell. Habakkuk 2 and verse 4 says that God is of pure eyes than to behold iniquity. No sin can be in the presence of God. No sinner can be in the presence of God. There has to be a place known as hell, for sinners to go to because no sinner can come into the presence of God. God is infinitely, absolutely holy. Holy, 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 which means holy, holier, holiest. The righteousness of God demands that there be a place of hell because Hebrews 2 verse 2 says, every sin shall receive a just recompense. Every single sin in the history of the world will be punished. That is the righteousness of God. And the wages of sin is death, eternal death. Every sin in the history of the world will be punished, either punished in hell are punished in Christ, but every sin will be punished. No sin will be overlooked by a holy God. No sin will just be swept under the carpet. Further, the love of God demands that there be a place called hell because God loves His own people so much, He wants to protect them from all kinds of vile people in this world. And as you and I would be going to heaven, you and I who are believers in Jesus Christ, it is the love of God that separates us from all the vile people. And then the wrath of God. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. God is an angry God. God is angry with the wicked every day. There's more to the story than smile, God loves you. God is angry with the wicked every day. Psalm 5, verse 5, Psalm 7, Psalm 9, Psalm 11. And so hell is absolutely necessary because of the holiness of God, the righteousness of God, the love of God, and the wrath of God. If there was not a hell, God would no longer be holy. If there was not hell, God would no longer be righteous and loving and full of wrath. So we've said hell is a real place. Hell is absolutely necessary. Third, hell is heavily populated. More people will go to hell than will go to heaven. Vast multitudes will be in hell. And hell is filled with both the worst people and the best people. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9 gives us some insight as to who would be in hell. Mark Twain, the great American author from the 19th century, once said, I'll take heaven for its climate and hell for its company. Well, let's just see who's going to be in hell. 
In 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 9, it says, Do not be deceived. Or it says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, which are the limp-wristed homosexuals, nor homosexuals, that's the aggressive homosexual, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Every foul, corrupt, wicked, evil, depraved person in the history of the world will all be in one place forever. You're not going to want to be there. But not only the worst of people, the scum of society, also many of the best people from an outward perspective will be there as well. And in Matthew 7 and in verse 21, Matthew 7 and verse 21, Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not perform many wondrous works in your name? And I will say unto them in that day, depart from me, you who work iniquity. I never knew you. Even those people who think that they are serving God in the church but who have never been born again will find themselves in the bowels of hell. The best of people and the worst of people will find themselves in hell. Hell is heavily populated. There are many roads to hell. Only one road to heaven. Proverbs 14 verse 12 says, There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is the end of death. Jesus said it is the few who are on the narrow path. It is the many who are on the broad path. Uh, There will be more in hell than there will be in heaven. Fourth, Hell is an eternal separation. It is a separation from loved ones. It is a separation from loved ones who know the Lord Jesus Christ. Unsaved husbands will be separated from their saved wives. Unsaved children will be separated from their parents. Unsaved parents will be separated from their saved children. There will be a a great chasm that will be set as many people will no longer see their loved ones again. Yet it will not be a separation from God. This may shock you, but God will be in hell. And God will be the one inflicting the wrath. Was that really necessary for the water? Yeah. (laughs) Speaking of hell. (laughs) God will be in hell because God is omnipresent and God is everywhere present. There is no place where God does not exist. God is in every square inch of the entire universe, and hell is a created place in the universe that God has created, and those who are in hell will not be inflicting themselves, and the devil will not be the one who is inflicting punishment upon the others. There is only one who can administer the wrath of God, and that is God Himself, and God will be doing it directly in hell. In Revelation chapter 14 and verse 10, it says those who are in hell will be in the very face of the Lord Jesus Christ, as Christ, by His Spirit, will be the one who will be unleashing the fury of His wrath in hell. 
Hell is a place of eternal separation. Number five, hell is a fiery furnace. Uh, think of a furnace, how as the sides come into a furnace, how it intensifies the heat and how it compresses the heat. And the image here of a, of a furnace with a fire on the inside speaks of severe, intense heat for those who are on the inside who are being baked alive. And we read in Matthew 13 and verse 42 that God will throw them into the furnace of fire. They will be roasted alive, yet they will never be able to die. They will be sustained in a resurrection body. God will give them a body that will be perfectly suited to their new environment. Just as we will receive a new body to be in heaven, it will be a, a body that is perfectly adapted for heaven, by which we will be able to worship God forever and ever. We will be able to serve God forever. We will never grow weary. We will never grow tired. Throughout all of the ages to come, we will have a glorified body in which we will enjoy the pleasure of God forever. We will have a heightened sense of of the awareness of God in heaven, far more than the sense of awareness that we have of God in this world. It will be exponentially intensified in heaven that we will be able with glorified eyes to look upon God, with glorified heart be able to love God, with a glorified body to never grow weary, to never grow tired in our worship and service of God. The same will be true in hell there will be a new body for souls in hell that will be perfectly adapted to the fiery furnace, a body that will never burn up yet will be on fire, uh, a body that will never be extinguished or be exterminated, but will have the capacity to be on fire yet never shrivel up with an intensified ability to feel pain. Whatever we feel of pain in this life with this body, it will be exponentially greater in hell to absorb the full furnace. In this fiery furnace, damned souls will be incarcerated in fire. They will be encased in fire. There will never be any relief outside of the fire. They will be forever smoldering in the wrath of God. And in this life, there is no more painful experience than for someone to be burned alive. Uh, I carry in the front of my Bible a picture of a man named John Rogers who in 1555 was the first martyr burned at the stake by Bloody Mary. And in the back of my preaching Bible, I have a picture of him in the flames as he is being burned alive unto his death in front of his church in Smithfield in London. It's the most painful death that, that one could die. It would be a mercy to die immediately, instantly in an electric chair or, or to drown to death but to be burned alive is the most excruciating death there is. And this is what those who are in hell will experience. And hell is a real place with real fire that will infl inflict real pain upon real people with a real body. Hell is a fiery furnace. Six, hell is a lake of fire. Everything about hell is fire. Revelation 19 and verse 20 says they were thrown alive into the lake of fire. It's very important that he even says they're thrown alive into the lake of fire. Um, there's no unconscious state for those who are in hell. 
Uh, there is no soul sleep for those who are in hell. It is a very awake, alert, conscious existence as they are thrown into the lake of furnace of fire, as it is described as a lake of fire. This means that people are literally baptized in fire. They are immersed in fire. They are swimming in fire. They are engulfed in fire, yet never able to swim out of the lake of fire. They are forever preserved in this lake of fire. They are drowning in fire. They are thrown alive into the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone. This is like pouring gas onto fire, to pour the brimstone onto the fire. And the brimstone speaks of burning sulfur as it causes an explosion of heat and of fire for those who are in hell. Hell is a lake of fire. Imagine being tossed into a lake, and every square inch of your body is covered with the water as you are in the water, you are submerged in the water, you are surrounded by the water. Those in hell are thrown almost as if they're being thrown into an active volcano and find themselves submerged in, a, in the red, hot, molten lava that is spewing out of the volcano, yet with this new body able to stay alive and not be consumed. What a picture. What a serious, dramatic picture this is. And I know some people try to do an end run on this, and they say, well, that couldn't possibly be literal fire, is it? Well, of course it's literal fire. But let's just say for a moment it's symbolic. The picture never fully represents the reality of what it portrays. The picture is always but a weak representation of the fullness of whatever it is it is depicting. You could only wish it's real fire if you're going to hell because if it's only a symbolic picture, whatever it is representing is much worse than the reality of fire. Hell is a lake of fire. Number seven, hell is an unquenchable fire. Hell is an unquenchable fire, meaning the fire of hell will never be extinguished. It will never be put out. The flames will never be turned down. John the Baptist in Matthew 3 and verse 12 said that God will burn up the chaff with an unquenchable fire. And the imagery here, back in the first century, was a farmer who would bring in from his field his grain, and the highest mountain on his land, he would build a threshing floor up on that highest point, because that's where the wind would blow the strongest. So he would bundle up his grain and cart it up to the threshing floor on the highest hill of his property, and with a pitchfork, he would toss the grain up into the air, and the heavier kernels that were worth something would come straight down onto the threshing floor because of the weight of them, and they would be gathered up and taken off to market, but the chaff is just worthless. The chaff is, is lightweight. And when the wind blows, it doesn't blow the kernels away, it blows the, the chaff away, and it's just driven out into the field because it has no value whatsoever to anyone for anything. It's just worthless. And so in this imagery, let me read it again, God will burn up the chaff
And so God will have zero value to the kingdom of God, zero value to the gospel, no value to the cause of Christ, the kingdom of Christ whatsoever. God will just gather up every worthless sinner and depose of them in the unquenchable fire. Yesterday, I was in my hotel room, and the church was very nice to bring a few things to eat over to my hotel room, and I had put on the oven a box of cereal. And unknown to me, I had accidentally turned the oven on. And as I was standing there just looking for something, and I couldn't figure out what it was. And so I looked in the, the bathroom, the toilet room, and there was nothing burning in there, and now it's stronger, and I couldn't figure it out. And then I looked, and I saw that the, that the stove, rather the stove, was glowing with orange and red, and the box of cereal now has caught fire. So I just grabbed the box of cereal and just tossed it onto the floor, and the smoke was everywhere, and I saw how to turn it off, which I did turn it off, and there were like cornflakes everywhere. <laughs> I had to go down to the office and ask the man if I could borrow a vacuum cleaner, and he said no, he would come do it, so that was good. But that fire, I was able to turn it off. I was able to turn it out. It was just on for 10, 15 seconds. Can you imagine the fires of hell never being quenched, never being extinguished, uh, never being turned off, never being snuffed out? That's what hell will be. In fact, Jesus said in Mark 9, verse 43, he says, those who go into hell will go into the unquenchable fire. Eternal God will maintain the eternal fire by His eternal wrath forever and ever and ever. The flames of hell will always be burning, and those in hell will always be on fire. Not only is hell an unquenchable fire, but number eight, hell is eternal fire, which is really saying much the same, yet with different words, and the word eternal means into the ages to come. The idea is, is that there is no end to the ages to come. It will just go on forever and ever and ever and in Matthew 25, 41, Jesus said that He will say to unbelievers on the last day, Depart from me, accursed ones, into eternal fire. And in Jude 7, it says the punishment for eternal fire will be without end. There will be no end to the blazing of the fires of hell, no relief, and no pause. Hell will be as long as heaven exists. Now, there are some theologians today who are annihilationists, and they say that God is such a God of love that those who are in hell would only be there for a brief moment and that they will not be sustained throughout all of the ages to come in eternal fire, and that they would remain in eternal fire, that they would just be annihilated, and they would cease to exist and come to an end. The problem with that, really the, the falsehood of that, the very same words that are used to describe the length of heaven in the book of Revelation are the very same words that are used to describe the length of hell. And so just as heaven is an eternal existence with God in heaven forever, so hell is eternal 
fire throughout all of the ages to come. Ninth, hell is day and night. In Revelation 14 and verse 11, it says that those who are in hell have no rest day and night. In Revelation 20, verse 10, it says they are tormented day and night. In other words, not only are those who are in hell tormented every day throughout all eternity, they are on fire every moment of every day throughout all eternity. There's never a break. There is never relief. There is never time off. Uh, They are never eased from the flames of hell day and night, day and night, day and night throughout all of the ages to come without one single moment of rest. So what have we said to this point? We said hell is a real place. Hell is absolutely necessary. Hell is heavily populated. Hell is an eternal separation. Hell is a fiery furnace. Hell is a lake of fire. Hell is an unquenchable fire. Hell is eternal fire. Hell is day and night torment. Number 10, hell is unmitigated torment. By unmitigated, we mean undiminished, never lessening, never moderated. It is always severe and intense. In Matthew 13 and verse 42... And again in verse 50 of Matthew 13, it says, Hell is the place of the weeping and the gnashing of teeth. In your English translation, it will just say, weeping and gnashing of teeth. But in the original language, the definite article, the, is in front of weeping and gnashing, and that's very important. What it is saying is, of all the weeping in the history of the world... Of all of the weeping that has taken place at funerals and in war and in catastrophes and in crisis and in, and in sorrow, all of the weeping in the history of the world does not begin to compare to the weeping of those who are in hell. Their weeping is the weeping, not just a weeping, but the weeping. As the shrieks and the cries and the groans and the moans of those who are in hell as they cry out in the affliction of the flame. It is also the gnashing of teeth. And that is what someone does who is undergoing severe pain and anger. And people in hell are not repenting and they're not turning to God and saying, Oh God, be merciful to me the sinner, they are gnashing their teeth and they are clenching their fist and they are shaking it in the face of God as they are filled with rage and anger against God that God would do this to them, that God would consign them to such a place as hell. And of all of the anger and all of the rage that has ever taken place in the history of the entire world, it pales into, in, into insignificance compared to the gnashing of teeth in hell. As though grinding down their teeth, yet with this new body never able to totally grind down their teeth. People in hell are not repenting. They're not calling out to God for salvation. They are angrier with God than when they were alive on planet earth. In Luke 16 and verse 28, hell is referred to as this place of torment. 
And this word torment in the original Greek language refers to the rack or instrument of torture by which one is forced to give an answer. It refers to like the the, the stretching rack, rack that they would put a body on and we're going to get the answer out of you one way or another and we're going to tighten the screws and we're going to stretch you out until you tell us what we need to know and literally stretching and stretching a person until they just literally break in two yet in hell with their their new body they will always be stretched out as it were but never do they break always under the torment of this place, the extreme pains of hell, to the breaking point, yet never breaking, always screaming, and the excruciating pain of torment. It's the repeated word that is used to refer to hell is the word torment. In Revelation 14, in verse 10, it speaks of those in hell being tormented with fire and brimstone. In Revelation 14, verse 11, it speaks of the smoke of their torment. And in Luke 16, verse 23, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, we read in verse 23, in Hades, he lifted up his eyes in torment. And he cried out, Father Abraham... Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. Oh, if he could just dip his little finger into a cup of water and just a drop of water on the tip of my tongue, I beg you for this. Just even that brief relief of a drop of water while I am in hell. In Revelation 20 and verse 10, it speaks of damned souls in hell who are tormented day and night forever and ever. No one's laughing in hell. They're not telling jokes in hell. They're not replaying smutty little lines in hell. Everyone in hell is screaming and, and, and crying out as they are in this lake of fire, in this furnace of fire, as they are under torment, as though they are stretched out on a rack with the, with the wrath of God inflicting pain from the top of their head to the bottom of their feet to every extremity in their body forever and ever and ever. This is the Word of God. Number 11, we need to talk about hell. We we need to talk about this. We we can't play like there's no place called hell. Number 11, hell is outer darkness. The panic of being blind and not being able to see And living in a world of darkness is an extraordinary fear. That you live your existence for the rest of your life without any sight. And those in hell will live an existence of outer darkness. Never again being able to see anything with their eyes. In Matthew 8 and verse 12, it says they will be cast out into the outer darkness. The outer darkness is the darkest of the darkness. The outer darkness is so dark you can't see the hand in front of your face. In Matthew 22, in verse 13, in the parable of the man who tried to come into the king's banquet without putting on the king's robe, picturing the one who would try to enter into the kingdom of heaven without the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ, 
The king says, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness. And that is what God will do. On the last day, Christ will literally cast every unbeliever down the chute into the bowels of hell, into outer darkness, never to see the light of day again. In Matthew 25 and verse 30, Jesus told another parable in which He says, Throw out the worthless slave into the outer darkness, that place of no light, that place never to see again with one's eyes, uh, that place of physical blindness and spiritual blindness, the sheer panic of living in a world of darkness throughout all of the ages to come. Uh, Jude 7 speaks of the eternal bonds under darkness. And these bonds speak of chains, to be locked up in chains forever and ever and ever under darkness. How horrific must hell be. R.C. Sproul, the great theologian in America, has told me that you cannot think about hell for long without almost going insane. Number 12, hell is conscious awareness. One's mind will never be more active and alert and sharp than when they are in hell. They will never be more fully alive than when they are in hell. And they will have a conscious existence and they will have extraordinary memory to remember back over the course of their life every time they ever heard the gospel and they rejected it, every time they were offered the goodness of God and the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they slammed that door shut, forever in their mind they will be replaying the entirety of their life in the torment of their memory and be haunted by the remembrances of the fool that they were to have rejected the offer of the gospel in Jesus Christ. In Luke 16, in verse 25, God says, Child, remember that during your life you receive good things. In hell, people will be able to remember. They will be able to retrace and, and restep the stages of their life, the events of their life, and they will be able to go back to times that they have long since forgotten during their earthly life. And as they wake up in hell, they will have a new awareness and remembrance of what they have long since forgotten. Those good things that were offered to them principally in the gospel. And they just procrastinated. They just wanted to put it off. They just didn't have time. Well, you will remember it forever in hell. And it will haunt you throughout all the ages to come. In Revelation 19, in verse 20, it says that they are thrown alive into the lake of fire which burns with brimstone. Not asleep, not unconscious, but fully alive. Number 13. Hell is an inescapable pit. In Revelation 9, verse 2, it is a bottomless pit, meaning it is so deep you can never crawl out of it. It is so deep it is inescapable. No one can even get to the bottom of the flames of hell, but it is so deep 
that no one can ever come up out of hell. It is a bottomless pit. In other words, there are many roads that lead into hell, but there are none that lead out. There are no exit signs in hell. The doors are locked in hell. The key is thrown away. It's an inescapable place. Think of the panic of that. That once you're in, you can never come out. There's no parole. There's no time off. There's no weekend leave. Once you're there, you're there. Number 14. Hell is easily accessed. It's so easy to go to hell. It's so easy. You have to strive to go through the narrow gate that leads to heaven. But it's so easy to go to hell. What do you have to do to go to hell? Nothing. You just remain where you are. Because if you're an unbeliever, you're already going to hell. There's nothing to do. You just don't respond. You just don't believe. You don't have to lift a finger to go to hell. You don't have to bat an eyelash to go to hell. There's nothing that you have to do to go to hell. It's the easiest thing in the world to go to hell. Just remain as you are in your unbelief and in your lack of commitment, in your insubordination to the Lordship of Christ, and you're on your way. It's the broad gate that leads to destruction, and it's so broad, you, you could drive a trailer through it. You, you could drive a train through it. You, you could drive the whole continent of New Zealand through the broad gate. You, you don't have to repent. You don't have to submit. You don't have to discard. You don't have to turn your back to the world. You just, it's so wide, you can live however you want to live. You can believe whatever you want to believe. You can do whatever you want to do. It's so easy to go to hell. Hell is easily accessed. In fact, all you have to do to go to hell is just be born. And never be born again. Finally, hell must be avoided. <laughs> Whatever you do, don't go to hell. Jesus said in Matthew 5, verse 22 and 28 and verse 29. Listen to what Jesus said. If your right eye makes you stumble... Tear it out, throw it from you, for it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. In other words, if your eye is lusting and, and in sin looking at things you should never be looking at, it would be better for you to pluck out your eye and just throw it away. Otherwise, if you do not, your whole body is going to go to hell. And then he says in verse 30, if your right hand makes you stumble. In other words, it's not just now that your eye is looking upon what it should not be looking on. Now your hand becomes active and your hand is on what it shouldn't be on. And your hand is doing what it should not be doing. If your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. What Jesus is saying, do anything but go to hell. Pluck out your eye, cut off your hand. Do whatever is necessary. Be anything except damned. It's a call for radical repentance. It's a call for dealing with sin in a, in a radical, dramatic way. 
But it would be better for you to lose one of the parts of your, of your body right now than for your whole body to go to hell. So, let me ask you in conclusion. Are you going to hell? That may be the most important question anyone will ever ask you. Don't go to hell. Go to heaven. Go to the place where there's joy and peace and Christ and believing parents and believing siblings and believing grandparents. You're, you're going to want to be in heaven. But hell is an awful place. Hell is a despicable place. Yet hell is a necessary place that has been created by God for those who reject the gospel of Jesus Christ. So have you ever believed in Jesus Christ? Have you ever committed your life to Christ? Have you ever been born again? Have you ever truly entered through the narrow gate? Not do you know the answers in your head. Not do you hang out with other Christians. The question is not, do you, do you live in a Christian home? Do you attend a good Bible teaching church? You can go straight to hell from a Christian family. You can go straight to hell from a Bible preaching church. You can go straight to hell from the pews of the church. You must be born again. Except you be born again, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say unto you, you must be born again. And so, I want to urge you, avoid hell at all costs. Because once you're in, you'll never come out. And once you're in, all the weeping and the gnashing of the history of the world combined will not compare to your single weeping and gnashing of teeth throughout all the ages to come. And if you've never believed upon Jesus Christ, I mean truly in your heart and in your soul, I want you to know this very moment, the gates of paradise are swung wide open. And the arms of the Lord Jesus Christ are extended to you in the free offer of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and many are those who find it. The gate is narrow and the way is small that leads to life, and few are those who find it. Jesus says, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. For my burden is easy and my yoke is light. And Jesus says, if anyone thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. Come unto me and drink, and out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. The Lord Jesus Christ stands in that narrow gate and He is calling you to Himself even through this message, this very second and this very moment. And I would urge you, I plead with you to commit your life to Jesus Christ, to entrust yourself to Him. Because if you die without believing in Christ, you'll go to hell forever. And you'll burn forever. And you'll never escape. Don't risk it. Don't play the fool. And say, you know, one day, that day may never come. Commit your life to Christ now. This moment in your heart. Right now. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. Boast not yourself of tomorrow, for you know not what a day, a day may bring forth. 
There is a sense of urgency for everyone in this room to believe in Christ now while you have opportunity. Or one day, you may wake up in hell. And you'll remember this message forever. You'll remember every single one of these 15 points, whether you wrote them down or not. And they will haunt you. That you had your day. You had your time. You had your moment. And you squandered it. Come to Christ. And live. And be saved from the wrath to come. I'm going to close in a word of prayer and then we're finished. Father in heaven, if you did not teach in your word the reality of hell, we could scarcely believe it. It almost seems like just a tale or a story. And yet, we read what Jesus said and what's recorded in your word, and we realize it's as real as heaven is real. It's as real as this world we live in right now. Lord, we believe your word. And so I pray for everyone that's in this room right now that no one will go to hell. And God, I pray that those who are not yet saved, those this very moment who are not yet, have not committed their life to Christ, will even this second, before I close this prayer within their heart, commit their life to Christ. So Lord, may there be no delay. May there be immediate obedience and full response to the free offer of the gospel in Jesus Christ. May no one in this room go to hell. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless each and every one of you, and God will bless you if you're in Christ. If not, it's another story.